session on Hour of the Truth in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update tonight in another study of understanding the 70th week of Daniel by reading and studying the New Testament because this is what it's all about. The New Testament is proof that Jesus Christ was and still is by the way the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, especially the verses between verse 24 and 27 at the end of the chapter. This is the 16th study we do so far today, and I am very glad that I can welcome my brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, from the other side of the ocean to Den, to our broadcast here. Hello, Tom. Welcome. Hello. I hope everything Hello. is all right. Hello, Yerk, and everyone that's listening, and it's my pleasure, privilege, and blessing to be here and uh, to continue proving from the New Testament text uh, the very words that were uttered, uh, written by Daniel in his prophecy of the 70th week that Jesus did perfectly and completely fulfill the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. And uh, all of the talk of a future 70th week is for a diabolical purpose. And that is to cause the whole world to receive a false Messiah. And uh, if you've been listening, you understand these things for yourself. And you are now tuned in to read the New Testament First, taking the church's glasses off your face, because if you don't, if you leave the church's glasses on your face when you read, you're going to see futurism in the scriptures, because that's what the churches have been teaching you all your life. You need to forget all that and read the New Testament for the first time as though you've never seen it before, and also read it with Daniel's 70-week prophecy written on a three-by-five card right by, right beside your Bible. And you'll see for the first time in your life that the New Testament is proof positive, infallible proof, that Jesus came for the very purpose of fulfilling Daniel's prophecy perfectly and completely, and that the Messiah, the Prince spoken of, and the Prince that shall come spoken of in Daniel's prophecy is not some phony futurist antichrist of the future, but Jesus Christ and his seven-year period of time, uh, the, the last seven years of Daniel's prophecy, 
beginning with his bat, b- baptism by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, three and a half years later, causes, causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming a sacrifice himself, reconciling us to God, bringing in everlasting righteousness, putting an end of sin, and opening the kingdom for his saints. And then the remaining three and a half years, the gospel, or or rather the, the covenant in his blood was offered to the Jews and Jerusalem until the very end of that final three and a half year period, making seven years total, when they when the Sanhedrin of Jerusalem finally rejected the gospel and the covenant in in Christ's blood and they stoned Stephen from that point on the gospel went to the gentiles the 70th week of Daniel is perfectly and completely fulfilled 2000 years ago and now you must understand what you must do with anyone who preaches a future fulfillment of that prophecy. Because one thing you have to concede, if Jesus fulfilled it 2,000 years ago, any talk of a future fulfillment has a diabolical purpose. And just as the Jews knew not the time of their visitation because they were forbidden to read and discuss Daniel's prophecy, Likewise, in our generation, we will be expecting the return of Christ at a certain period of of time during a final seven-year period of time, and it isn't going to be Jesus. It's going to be a counterfeit Jesus, and they're going to put the onus of Antichrist on whoever they can conjure up to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews and then three and a half years later break that treaty. At that point, no one will be amenable to any talk of a uh, of a perfect and complete fulfillment of that prophecy 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. And they will be hell-bent to receive a false Messiah. It'll be almost impossible to change anybody's mind. So while there's still time to work, Yerk and I are working full-time to make sure God's people, those who uh, God gives their ear to us to, to, to listen to what we have to say, an opportunity to hear the finally the truth, a truth that you won't hear in the churches, you will not hear in the churches. They're all agents of Rome. They all foment the future lie, the futurist lie. They are bound and determined to deceive you, to receive the plagues, of, of uh, Rome's judgment when it comes, and uh, we want you not to have to suffer those plagues. So with that said, we'll just go to York now for, 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 for excuse me, further reading of Daniel's prophecy and the biblical text proving its fulfillment 2,000 years ago. Yes, and we also want everybody who watches this video or watches these videos, the whole series, to understand that our reading here is not like a sermon or not like a preaching from any pulpit or internet platform or whatever. But we are proving to you biblically, by reading the Bible and by reading the texts, the real meaning of the Bible without any personal interpretation. And we want you to confirm that through your own studies. This or these videos, this series, is a help for self-help. I mean, it is so easy to say, help yourself, then, help, uh, then God will help you too. That's right. If you only rely on other men to help you and to explain things to you, God will not intervene. Because you don't rely on him, you rely on other men. We want you to rely on God and on God's word. And we are just showing you the way but you have to walk the walk yourself. And I think that is the most important message that we can give here. Tom and I are not preachers. We are not pastors. 
we are not biblical scholars, we are just Christians who open up the book and being led by the Holy Spirit come to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit leads us to that the Bible is the infallible word of God and that everything that he wrote in there and everything that he prophesied in there is infallible and came true. Not all prophecies come through, came true yet, that's true, there are a few open yet, but most of them came through, and especially Daniel chapter 9 came through. And this is what we are going to prove to you. We take New Testament texts and we show you by that text that they all point to Jesus Christ as the perfect fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. That's it all about, but you have to do these studies on your own. Don't rely on what we say. Maybe you come even up with other verses in the New Testament. You say, oh, look, this is also proof that that and Tom and Jörg didn't speak about that. Well, <laughs> we are just men. We can miss out. But we tell you that overall, the complete New Testament wouldn't even exist if Jesus hadn't come 2,000 years ago and fulfill Daniel's prophecy of chapter 9. Right, Tom? Very interesting point. That's exactly right. The New Testament would be much, much smaller if it were not for the fact, the historical fact, that Jesus came to fulfill Daniel's prophecy, and the New Testament is the historical record of that fulfillment. Now, if Jesus had not come to fulfill any particular prophecy then uh, there would be much less to write about for the New Testament. But uh, certainly the volume of the New Testament is written for the purpose of showing infallibly that Jesus fulfilled that 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, that seven-year period of time, perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago. And the main thrust of it is not only to recognize that, but to debunk the futurist uh, lie that that seven-year period of time is yet future and, the, and to expose to you or to help you discover for yourself the consequences of believing in a future fulfillment. That's the whole purpose of 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 foisting upon us this, this futurist uh, uh, interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. Number one, to deny that Jesus was the Christ, because that's what you are doing if you believe in a future 70th week of Daniel. Tremendous victory for Satan if he can get the whole world to believe in a future 70th week of Daniel it's just the same as saying the whole world, anybody who believes in futurism, even though they say with their mouth that Jesus is the Christ, if they say the 70th week of Daniel's future, they are denying out of the other side of their mouth that Jesus was the Christ. And then to, to put this 70th week of Daniel into the future and then have it be fulfilled by an antichrist is, is uh, the greatest of all delusions, and it has consequences equivalent to that great de deception of the whole Bible in, in uh, Genesis, in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. I think it is safe to say, Tom, that by teaching futurism to the world, Satan wants to convert his loss at the cross into a gain over the whole world and over Jesus That's Christ. Right. Yeah, to, to, to absolutely uh, cause God's people to exclude themselves from the salvation that Jesus won for them 2,000 years ago. That's Satan's design. To make fools of us all. To make us, without our knowledge, to make us reject, uh, uh, repudiate Jesus to deny Jesus and his messiahship. That's the purpose of it all. And it may take some effort on the part of the listeners individually to come to these conclusions, but these are the inevitable conclusions one comes to when one has exerted himself and studied these things and the scriptures and Daniel's prophecy 
all of a sudden your eyes are going to be open. And every time you read the New Testament, every time you talk about these subjects, more and more is revealed to you. It's just like uh, a waterfall of revelation begins to come upon you when you realize 70 weeks are over. Thank God they are, or the kingdom of heaven would not be among men. Our sin debt would not have been paid. Our reconciliation with the Father would not be complete. And uh, we would still be yet in our sins. Horrifying thought, isn't it? But without Christ fulfilling the 70th week of Daniel, we've got nothing to look forward to. No hope in the body of Christ for those who believe in futurism. Because in believing in futurism, they've denied that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And therefore, he was not the Messiah. I don't know how many different ways I can say it. I don't know how many different times I can say it before it becomes monotonous and boring. But trust me, when you get into this, when you, when you occupy yourself in doing these, your, these studies for yourself, trust me, you won't be bored. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. So we're going back to the paper that we haven't been reading for a while because we were explaining this facts to you from another point of view. Today we are going back and we are going to read and then understand Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, which is the final verse of the chapter. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now you may ask yourself, why is he pronouncing, especially pronouncing the words he and the weak? Well, it's because those are the key words of the chapter <coughs> that lead to the understanding he is Jesus Christ and the week is directly followed, the 70th week directly followed by the 62 plus 7 weeks that went before, 69 weeks. There is no gap. So we ask ourselves, who confirms the covenant for one week? It is Jesus who confirmed the new covenant. It is not the Antichrist. There is no speak of the Antichrist in the whole chapter 9 of Daniel's prophecy. It is always about Jesus Christ. Antichrist is not mentioned here. Oh, Antichrist is mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 and other chapters later, but not in chapter 9. This is only about Jesus Christ because Daniel prayed for the forgiveness of sins for his people. He even asked the question, Lord, if we are taken out of the world, who will there be a witness to you in the world? And that's why the Lord sent Gabriel to comfort Daniel and to tell him there is one coming that will confirm the covenant of the fathers for one week with many. And that is Jesus. You can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will never ever see any reference that any Antichrist is confirming any covenant anywhere, nowhere in the Bible. Now let's look at some verses and texts from the New Testament that confirm what we just read in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27. Galatians chapter 3 verse 17. And this I say, this is Paul speaking, that the covenant that was confirmed before God, before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Now this is a very interesting verse because all of a sudden we see the law. What law are we talking about here? Well, we are talking about the Ten Commandments. We are speaking about the moral law 
the law that was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. That means the promise was to the Israelites and, well, I, I lost a little bit of my train of thoughts, Tom. Help me here. This is a very, very profound word because it speaks about 400 years. Uh, they were in captivity in, um, uh, in Egypt. And 430 years after, that is the time when they wandered through the desert and the law was uh, being taught by Moses from Mount Sinai, brought, brought to the Israelite. Yeah? And that law cannot disannul that effect. So that means that, um, how am I going to say this? <laughs> the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that covenant. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very important well, point that we speak well, about The covenant here. that God made with the, with the Jews uh, on, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the mountain... Uh, was a covenant uh, that if you do this law, uh, then God will be with you. But the trouble is, the law is not perfect in that it can only condemn, okay? Right. Because every man sins. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why when the, when the commandment was given... This was the standard uh, that, that Jesus uh, perfectly performed, which is what made him fit to become the Messiah. He, he came into this world in the flesh of a man, and unlike every other man fashioned in the likeness and image of God who were sinners, Jesus did not violate that law. And he's the only flesh and blood man who ever uh, lived in a robe of flesh who did not sin. That's what makes him the Messiah. Okay? And just as we understand that Paul said, we, we don't abolish the law, we enforce the law. We, we, uh, what was the word Paul used? We establish the law, he said. So it's by the law that every man is condemned and it is also by that law that we can positively understand who the Messiah is. Because he's the only one that lived and breathed the breath of life that was perfect and without sin. Okay? Now, uh, there was the, the law of animal sacrifice that if... They sinned, and of course every Jew would sin in some form or fashion at some time or other, break one, two, or all ten of those commandments. There was a means of receiving mercy from Almighty God, and that was the law of animal sacrifices, where they would go to their temple with a lamb, place their hands upon the head of the lamb, confess their sins upon the head of the lamb, and then the high priest would slay the animal, take the blood, and 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 offer it in the in the uh, sanctuary. And then once a year, the high priest would offer sacrifice for the whole nation, and and sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat in the holy of holies. Okay, so the law is firmly established. It condemns every man. That's the only purpose the law ever served was to show man his out of uh, fellowship with God, that there must be a remedy. There must be a remedy for sin. But that and law does not, the law does not disannul the covenant that was made before. This is the no. point, I think, of this verse, because no, the, the, the covenant was made before the Egyptian captivity. That's why it speaks about 430 years. Then they went, the, the covenant was made, then they went into 400 years of captivity, and then they went 40 years wandering through the desert, when after 30 years they were given the law. This law cannot disannul the covenant. That's why Jesus Christ then came in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, to confirm that covenant with that right. many. I just had a moment to, to 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 let that sink in to understand yep. this correctly, Tom. But yeah, and this. he was the he was the sacrificial lamb that would bring in everlasting righteousness, 
and, and reconcile us to God and put an end of sacrifices. Okay? The blood of lambs and goats could not take away sin. Only Christ could take away sin, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. The system of animal sacrifices was only an inst uh, a manner of instructing the Jews, the Hebrews, about their lamb, their future messianic lamb who would come and reconcile them once and for all to God and put an end of sin. Yeah, my misunderstanding in the first reading of this was that the law was speaking of the moral law, but it's not. The law here is speaking of the sacrificial law, of the Levite law. Then we've, we've got to be careful because yeah. the, 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 the moral law never ends. It's immutable. It's unchangeable. It's forever. Okay? That's the standard upon which we get our Messiah, Jesus. He's the only one that could perfectly uh, 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 obey that law. Okay? But the Levitical Look, law if, was if, given 430 years later. If we, if we take away the Ten Commandments, if we take away the law of God, then there is no sin, according to Paul. He said, if we're not for the law, I would not have known sin. Yeah, and Jesus Christ right? said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So that's he ridiculous. Said if there, he says, if there's no law, then there's no sin. Well, if there's no law and no sin, then Christ died in vain. Because there's no need for a mediator. So we know the law will never die. It will never change. It will never go away. It's what establishes us all as guilty before God and in need of a Savior. Someone who can restore us to full and righteous relationship with God and do it for all eternity. And he's the only one that could keep that law perfectly and, and then stand in our place in, in the judgment which took place on Calvary's cross three and a half years after his baptism, in the midst of the week, in the midst of the week, the 70th week. Just as you said before, first there were uh, 69, uh, first there were, there were seven weeks and then 62 weeks, together making 69 weeks, that leaving only one week to fulfill. Okay? So a seven-year period of time when all of this would take place, the redemption of man would take place, and the law still stood, or it would be unnecessary at all for Jesus to make a covenant in his blood. Okay? He would die in vain. So don't think for a minute, don't let anybody ever tell you the law is abolished. The law is done away with. That's one of the great teachings in the, the apostate churches in this world. Common sense, listen folks, common sense dictates that if the law of God is done away with, or it was just for the Jews, then we have no sin. Because it's a violation of the law that cause, that is sin. Okay? And if we are sinless because there's no law to condemn us, then we have no need of Christ. And Christ died in vain. Simple logic dispels all the nonsense that is taught in the churches. Okay? That law will stand forever. That is the, the law that we violated that caused us to sin which brought us a, brought about the need for a savior. If it were not for the law, there would have been no sin and no need for Jesus. And certainly no need for any covenant that Jesus would make with us. A covenant in his blood. Because there would have been no need for Christ to shed his blood. Because there would be no forgiveness to offer for sin that doesn't exist. How many, how many different ways can I say it? Just plain as a nose on your face. The law is what condemns all mankind. Okay? 
without that law, there is no condemnation because there's no sin. How is it possible that we allow preachers to teach us that the law was just for the Jews? It's for all man. Okay, and we enjoy the covenant, the forever, eternal, eternal, irrevocable covenant that Jesus made with us in our behalf before the Father when he said, I came in my Father's name to offer myself a sacrifice to fulfill the covenant that you made in the law and make every man as though he had never sinned. Okay? How can you make man righteous if there's never no sin? All right? So Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law. If you believe your apostate pastor tells you that law is uh, that law was 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 uh, crucified with Christ, <laughs> then Christ had no need to die in the first place. It's devoid of even common sense, much less scriptural sense. That law remains and forever immutable, eternal, and it's what co universally condemns mankind and makes the de the absolute need for a south a savior. Uh, forever, okay? We need Jesus or we have no hope because we violated that law. That law has never been rescinded. God does not change his law. God's not a man that he should make a mistake. God's not a man that he should forget. God didn't make a mistake when he made that law. Man was universally condemned Damned by that law. There was only one hope of not suffering the pains of, of death because of that law, and that was the redemption in Christ, the shedding of his blood as a substitute for the shedding of our blood. And, uh, you know, and many people think that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm not. I'm not preaching to the choir. There aren't very many Christians in this world that know this stuff. Because they believe they're futurist pastors that say the law was just for the Jews. Okay? You better read that law. That's the law that you are redeemed from the curse of it by Jesus, who came at the very beginning of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. And, we're, and if he had not come, Right on time, as Daniel, look, you could just take Daniel's, your, Daniel's uh, prophecy and wait and listen for the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and then cast your calendar forward 483 years and make a red X on the calendar, and you would know precisely, possibly even to the day when Jesus would come and be baptized in the River Jordan, where he was anointed to preach the gospel of his blood. That's how precise Daniel's prophecy is. Leaves absolutely no room for doubt that Jesus was the Messiah, the Prince. And he did. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming accursed himself. And when he offered himself on the cross, the rocks did rent. The veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Christ said, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. The veil of the temple was rent, throwing open the Holy of Holies. No more need for animal sacrifices. No more need for a priest to enter behind that veil once a year to offer sacrifice for mankind. Jesus did it all. The once and for all sacrifice. Now, do we understand? Do you have any other questions? Now, if you understand all this, why in the world would you submit yourself to the teaching of a futurist pastor that tells you 
that the Jews, the Christ rejecting Jews, have to have a homeland in their in Israel today on the eastern end of the Mediterranean on and a temple built on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem so that they can eat and drink damnation to themselves by making further sacrifices. When God said in the New Testament, your house is left unto you desolate. And it said, for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. Now, somebody will try to tell you that that was just till the consummation of the, of the, of the Roman 10th Legion, the war, the siege against Jerusalem. But I'm telling you, it's desolate even today. And it's going to be desolate if even God allows them to rebuild a temple on Temple Mount. It will be desolate. No God of glory nor his son will rule and reign from that man-made temple. And he's not going to receive any animal sacrifices from a rebuilt altar on top of Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Or he would be denying the salvation of his own son. He would be denying the blood that his son shed for us all. Your pastor... Your future as pastor's got a whole lot of splaining to do. Do you understand my meaning? He's got it wrong. He couldn't get it more wrong. Why? Because he's not a minister of righteousness. He's not a minister of Christ. He's a businessman. He's called in the Bible a hireling. He is a pastor for hire. And he's going to do whatever the customer tells him to do. Okay? You got itchy ears? You want to tell you you don't want to believe the truth? Well, you just hire a hireling that'll preach whatever you want him to preach from the pulpit. And there's a man in this world that, say, that thinks he runs Christianity that wants this lie told from every pulpit of every church in this country and around the world. It's called the papacy, because if you believe that Jesus was the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago, then you have to figure out who the Antichrist is, and you have to know from the scriptures that it was not long after Paul preached to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2 that that Antichrist was going to be revealed once the restrainer was taken out of the way. Then all of a sudden you realize there's no future Antichrist. It was whoever assumed that role as soon as the ruling Caesars were taken out of the way. Now you've got 2,000 years or nearly so of Christianity that has been under the deception of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. Now you've got it right. Now you can understand who is it that the Scripture says is guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus who deceives the whole world. All I'm doing is telling you what that deception is. It's called futurism. And it denies that the papacy from the first pope to the last is the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little, the little horn of Daniel, the Antichrist. And you have to believe that it's some future figment of some diabolical imagination that won't be a factor in your life anyway because you're going to be raptured out before it happens. You see how wonderful a fairy tale that is? Well, don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? Jesus made a covenant. A covenant in his blood that washes away all of our sins. One sacrifice, once and for all, that washes away sin, puts an end of sin, brings in everlasting righteousness. No one will ever have to make another sacrifice. And if they do, 
they've just rejected the sacrifice that Jesus made. Now, you know what that means for you Roman Catholics? You make sacrifice every week. You crucify Christ afresh every week. And then you eat and drink damnation to yourselves. That's right up Satan's alley. And that same church that teaches people to make sacrifices and to eat and drink damnation to themselves would have every Jew do the same thing. And not only that, since Vatican Council II, the papacy has put forward the idea that all Christians ought to unite even with the Roman Catholic Church, and that we all ought to celebrate a common sacrifice so that the whole Christian world should eat and drink damnation to themselves. Are you beginning to comprehend the consequences of believing in futurism? Are you beginning to comprehend that they have consequences equivalent to that that were that came about as a result of the fall in the Garden of Eden? What happened at the fall of man in the Garden of Eden when Satan flattered Adam and Eve and said, you will not die, but if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil, essentially calling God a liar. And what happened? man died all of a sudden he had a different father one who's condemned and so are we the bible says you were born dead in trespasses and sins does it not well if we're born dead in trespasses and sins then we have no way to save ourselves we have to be saved by a savior that's what Jesus was. And it was a perfect covenant that he made. One that did not depend upon our action to do anything but believe. And he confirmed that covenant in front of the whole world when he submitted to the authorities that eventually crucified him. And his blood was shed, a remission for sin. And the problem of sin is solved. You want to mess with that? By building temples and beginning animal sacrifices again? Whether you be Jew on Mount Moriah or a Gentile Protestant in a Protestant church following a papal Messiah? That's what you'd be doing if you convert the, con the communion of the Lord into a sacrifice as is demanded by the Roman Catholic Church. You, just like the Jews and the Catholics, will be eating and drinking damnation to yourself. You will be denying the blood of Christ that redeemed you from the curse of the law, and you will find yourself yet in your sin. Terrible prospects, isn't it? Now do you see why I say futurism is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden? In the Garden of Eden, man was condemned. Now, with the new deception called futurism, man curses himself. And Satan just loves every minute of it. The whole Christian world is ignorant of who the Antichrist is. Or rather, just the last three or four generations of Christians Everyone prior to that knew who the Antichrist was. They talked about it, they wrote about it, and their writings and speeches are still extant. You can read them and research them and, and come to the knowledge that we're the only ones who are deceived. Christianity 
true Bible believing Christians have always known who the Antichrist is. It's the papacy. And to suggest otherwise would be laughable to them. And you can prove it for yourself. All you got to do is read their works. Just ask yourself, why hasn't your pastor told you these things? Why hasn't your hireling told you these things? Because he's in it for the money, honey. He's not in it to save your soul. He's not in it to make sure you know the truth. Because the truth is a bitter pill. He's afraid you might throw him out of the church. Well, I'm here to tell you. That's what you should do tomorrow. And now you can understand why. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you, Tom, for that wonderful explanation of the law and the consequences of not understanding the 70th week of Daniel. That's why we're going to continue in the New Testament with Matthew 26, verse 28, where it says, For this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So, here we have again, for many. This is the same many that he confirms the covenant with in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. He confirms the covenant with his blood, and he does it for many. Remember, Daniel 9, 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So you see how this is being repeated in um, Matthew 26, 28. It speaks of the same many. This is where you see that the New Testament is the absolute proof and confirmation of Jesus Christ being the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, which is the Old, uh, Old um, Testament, but still there are many, many prophecies about Jesus Christ being the 70th week of Daniel. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Well, L and with the house of Judah. Daniel chapter 9 is about Daniel and his people. Yeah? We read that in Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, which are the Jews, and thy holy city. In Jeremiah it is already foretold that God will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Jesus Christ is that new covenant covenant with us. In verse 32 it says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, says the Lord. Not according to that covenant, but a new covenant, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Speaks of the um, circumcision of the heart here, not the circumcision in the flesh anymore. Also in Hebrews chapter 8, we find a few verses that are speaking of the confirmation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. In Hebrews 8, 8, it says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which is a confirmation of what we just read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 32 and 33, right? 31 and 32, 33, what we just read. This is confirmed in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8. Here you see again that the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, or the Old Testament and the New Testament, go hand in hand. You cannot have the one without the other. 
Again in verse 9 it says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. This is again a, referral, a reference to Jeremiah 31 that we just read. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now here you have three verses in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8, 9, 10, that confirm Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, 32, and 33. Isn't that wonderful how the Bible is written? Yes, and now how can anybody say that it's yet future? I don't know, Tom. Beats me. I don't get and it. And trust me, trust me, ladies and gentlemen, Yerk can, can, can attest to this too. We're only scratching the surface of the, of, the, of the textual evidence in the New Testament that confirms every claim that we've made. Look, prophecy is history foretold. You've heard that a million times. You can tell me that by heart, right? Prophecy is history foretold. So how are you going to know if a prophecy is fulfilled unless you have an accurate record of history to attest to the fulfillment? Do you realize we don't have to wait for fulfillment of any of these his, the, this, this prophecy, this history foretold? The Bible's the best history book you're ever going to open. The New Testament is that historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And I don't see how any man can read the New Testament and not see it for himself. There's so much evidence in the New Testament that for anybody to suggest that any portion not the whole seven years like they're teaching in the churches, but that any portion of that 70 weeks of Daniel is to be fulfilled yet in the future, which should immediately cause people to be in outrage. You've got to be kidding me! That should be the normal outrage that people should express when any pastor in this country or around the world should suggest that any portion, let alone the whole seven-year period, that any portion of Daniel's future, uh, prophecy is yet to be fulfilled in the future. The New Testament is just that complete in its record, infallible record, of the perfect and complete fulfillment of, seven, of the 70 weeks of Daniel. We should not sit in the pews one more day and listen to this cockamamie futurist baloney. And I'm giving it a compliment compared to what it really deserves. I'd be criticized if I called it what it really is. It's straight from the pit, ladies and gentlemen. It is straight from the pit of perdition. You can't find a more perfect way to reject Jesus as Messiah but by saying that the 70th week of Daniel or any portion of it is future. But that's what's taught from every church pulpit. The New Testament is the historical record of a prophecy given by Daniel as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It's our redemption. And it's historically recorded in the New Testament. Okay? Prophecy meets fulfillment, and it's all contained in the Bible so that nobody can mess with it. But your pastor's messed with it. He's told you it's future. He's telling you the New Testament is a liar. 
oh, there's something wrong. You either don't understand Daniel's prophecy or you don't understand the New Testament because we know the 70th week of Daniel's future. And an antichrist is going to be fulfilled, going to fulfill it, not Jesus. Look, ladies and gentlemen, you can't get more messed up than that. And that's what's taught from all the pulpits of all the churches in the United States and around the world. And why do they all teach us to protect the papacy from the undeniable accusation of Antichrist? They're all protecting the papacy. Why would they protect the man of sin, the son of perdition? Why would they teach anything that would prevent you from comprehending what all Bible-believing Christians have known for the last 2,000 years who the Antichrist is without a doubt. What kind of a spirit possesses people like this? These are all questions that you can answer if you'll just read and believe what the New Testament says. And it will prove beyond any doubt that your pastor is lying to you and that lie has the gravest of all consequences. And when the more and more you begin to comprehend this, you realize it is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Look, uh, if you're going to believe, if you're going to continue to believe, as many people will, that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, it's going to be fulfilled by an antichrist. You've got to quit saying that Jesus was the Christ. Because Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, came at the very beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. He was the 70th week of Daniel. And if you say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, you can't find a better way to deny that Jesus was the Christ or that Messiah came in the flesh. And that, according to the New Testament, is the spirit of Antichrist. And that's what's taught from the churches. The spirit of Antichrist is taught from the churches. Now, if Satan wanted to deceive God's people, where do you think he would have to go to do it? The churches, right? Well, if Satan walked into our churches, started talking his baloney, we'd instantly recognize it. We'd kick him right out, and we'd return to the gospel. Well, then why do you believe in futurism? And why do you pot tolerate a futurist pastor continue to preach it every Sunday? Why do you take up collections for the Jews to return to their own ancient homeland and begin to build a temple? Why do you care? Why do you why do you care about every nation on the planet? fixating itself on that little piece of land on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea like it was something holy? God said, your house is left unto you desolate. How do you get from desolate to holy without Christ being there? It's not the Holy Land. It's Hitler's answer to the final Jewish question. What Jews that Hitler and all of the, the Axis allies couldn't destroy during the First and Second World War, they can destroy just by allowing them to build a temple and make sacrifice and eat and drink damnation to themselves in a final rejection of Christ's blood. 
That's what it's all about, folks. That is what it's all about. And God's church, God's elect should have no part in it. But I'm telling you, this whole thing is driven by people who call themselves God's elect. Now, do you know where Satan would go if he wanted to deceive God's people? Right in the churches. Right behind the pulpit of every church in this land and around the world. And that's exactly what he's done. They can preach Jesus till the cows come home. If they say any portion of the 70th week of Daniel's yet future, they denied him out of the other side of their mouth. They taught me that cockamamie nonsense from cradle to grave, or nearly to the grave. If it weren't for the mercy and grace of Almighty God to bring me out of that deception, I was headlong a futurist. But I know better now. And I have a responsibility to expose the truth to God's people. And believe me when I tell you, the truth makes far more sense than the futurist bull that we've been fed all of our lives. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. I'll continue in Hebrews chapter 8, the verse 11. Where it says, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, A new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The word covenant is messianic and always applies to the Messiah, not the Antichrist. There is another question that will be raised, but that question we will read and discuss in our next broadcast the 70s, 17th, sorry, <laughs> the 70s, the 17th coming together between Tom and me to further elaborate on the so important fact that Jesus Christ was and still is the absolute and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9 and especially the verses 24 through 27. I know we quite hammer on this point again and again and again. So how many more times has the hammer come down to nail the truth into your heart that you will understand that futurism is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Jesus Christ was the complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week and Satan tries to turn that around, say the 70th week is future and by that he deceives you the second time. As Tom said, in the Garden of Eden mankind was deceived, gave up the obedience to the Heavenly Father and man died. Since then we are all born in trespasses and sins. Jesus Christ gave us new life on the cross when we accept his perfect once and for all sacrifice he did for us on the cross. And now the devil with futurism works on that you are not saved by the flesh, by the blood of Jesus Christ and therefore deceives the world a second time takes a little more time to do that because now there are more than two people in the world. The first time it was only Adam and Eve. Today we are, as they say, about seven and a half billion. But gullible seven and a half billion for the most part because people don't read their Bible and don't study their Bible. And that's exactly why Tom and I are doing these broadcasts to get you back to study the Word of God. Take off the church glasses, as Tom said. Just 
Read the Bible as if you have never had any teaching on the Bible before. Read it with an open mind and let the Holy Spirit lead you into all truth. Exactly that, what Jesus Christ promised when he said, It is expedient for me to go away, because if I do not go away, I cannot send you the Comforter, and he will lead you into all truth. He is to be found when he leads you into all truth by studying his word, the Bible, and therefore I just finish this broadcast with saying, please read your Bible. See you next time. Maranatha. Exalt his name together